My special guests on this week's U.S. Farm Report are Mr. Earhart Fingston, National Vice President of the National Farmers Organization, Mr. Charles Walters, Economist, and Mr. Jack Grimmer, National Farmers Organization leader from the state of California. These three gentlemen, a short time ago, visited in Washington with the agricultural representative on the Council of Economic Advisors, Dr. Hendrik S. Hudiker, a Netherlands and American trained and educated man. The Council of Economic Advisors was established in 1946 for the purpose of advising and guiding the chief executive. Members of the council represent all facets of the American economy. These three gentlemen came away from that interview in Washington in a state of amazement and near shock. And we will hear their story later, so stay tuned. Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. Let's get to the heart of our story today, the adventures of these three gentlemen in Washington in a visit with Dr. Hendrik Hodiker. Gentlemen, as Earhart Finkston knows, we make a great effort on U.S. Farm Report toward informality, particularly in uh, how we address one another. Uh, Earhart Fingston, as you all know, is best known to NFO members across the land and people in agriculture as Fink, and he will be so addressed today. Uh, Chuck, it would be remiss, I think, since you and I have been friends for many years, for me to call you on this show Mr. Walters, so if you don't mind, you will be Chuck, all right? All right? That's fine. And Jack and I have known each other for quite a while, and uh, so his name shall be Jack today, okay? I just thought we ought to get that all straightened out before we proceed. Chuck, can you give us uh, some background on the Council of uh, Economic Advisors? The Council of Economic Advisors was formed back after World War II. In other words, there was a general feeling among the people, the politicians, and everyone, that following a war, you were going to have a depression. Mm -hmm. And this is something the modern industrial society could not tolerate. So. We passed an act called the Employment Act of 1946, sometimes called the Full Employment Act, and it set up a council of three economic advisors, plus as many subordinates as they'd require, and their job would be to direct the president in the economic policy of the United States so as to maintain as near as possible full employment. Mm -hmm. Of course, the council is a slave of its own education, in its own philosophy. In this case, we feel that it's the uh, follower of another philosophy as enunciated by another committee, but this is a private committee which was founded in 1942, the Committee for Economic Development. Uh, Paul Hoffman was the first head of it. It was funded very heavily by the Ford Foundation and some of these other groups. We feel at this stage of the game that the Committee for Economic development has in fact written the policy paper for the United States government and though this policy paper has no official standing it has in fact been taken in in whole cloth and adopted by the Council of Economic Advisors. Chuck, the Committee of Economic Development although it is better known really isn't it as CED? That's right, CED. Uh, is not as you say government sponsored. No. Who, who is it? Wh who sponsors it? Well, this is a private agency. I guess ever since the Foundations Law came into being back in the Wilson administration, we've had a lot of these tax-exempt organizations or foundations that wrote policy papers. Uh, just to illustrate the point, we had one called the Foundation uh, for Economic Education, which uh, was a big factor back in the full parity days, right after World War II. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was, in a way, one of the uh, predecessors of a group like CED. 
51% uh, of its uh, funds came from no, few, uh, no more than uh, a handful of biological persons. And these were almost always the heads or board chairman of uh, corporations like General Motors, DuPont, uh, Goodrich Rubber, uh, National Steel. And then there were the rest of the contributions would come from uh, corporations as a corporate gift. Mm -hmm. uh, one, well, here's a small list I have. Armour, Chrysler, Con Edison, DuPont, General Motors, Goodrich, Gulf Oil, Sun Oil, Eli Lilly, and so on. Well, the Committee for Economic Development, or CED, uh, came on real strong because they hired Paul Hoffman to head it. He came straight from the Ford Foundation. He had worked in government, and it started writing its policy papers. Now, it came on in 1962 with an adaptive program for agriculture. It was actually, I believe, its third farm paper. And this is the one that has become the blueprint for the government's policy makers. Fink, why did you and Chuck and Jack go to Washington and seek out an interview with Dr. Houdeker? Our people that were in Washington contacting congressmen, letting them know what agriculture needed and what was wanted out here in rural America, were invariably making the statement that the congressmen were referring to the policy of the economic advisors. And of course, this policy seemed to be to advocate lower farm prices or pass legislation that would bring about lower farm prices. So we finally decided that perhaps uh, it would be a good idea if some of us who did know what the situation was and were able to, let's say, convey the idea call on the doctor that is the uh, advisor for agriculture and perhaps explain to him what the situation really was out here, what the costs were and so forth. And this is what led us to set up the appointment. I was there, of course, and we took Chuck because he is an economist and then, of course, uh, Grimmer, so that we'd have a representation mm -hmm. across the United States of people that uh, did know exactly what the policy was or help make an effort to change that policy. Well, Fink, what did Dr. Houdeker say to give you fellows this kind of reaction? He said that both the present and the past Department of Agriculture had been very unfair to the American farmers in leading them to believe that they were even trying to help them, that their assignment was to eliminate the human resources, or in other words, the people, and individual ownership from agriculture. Would you repeat that statement? Yes, he said that both the present and the past Department of Agriculture had been very unfair to the people or to the farmers in leading them to believe that they were even trying to help them, that their assignment was to eliminate the human resources, in other words, the farmers, and individual ownership from agriculture, and that was just one way to do it, and that is by lowering the farm prices. Well, no wonder you came away with the feelings you had. Chuck, let's develop this interview with Dr. Houdeker. What was its beginning point, and uh, how was it developed? Well, I think I, I opened the conversation. I referred to a speech that Dr. Houdeker had made in North Carolina, in which he said that farm prices should be set at a distress level. At a distress level. At a distress level. And I asked him, in view of the fact that all of the rest of the economy was highly organized, we had, in effect, administered prices in automobiles, in manufactured goods, in labor. We've had the Wagner Act and all that sort of thing. Uh, I, I didn't understand the economic thinking behind this, and I wanted some sort of an explanation. Did he give you that? Well, he fell back on uh, the precept that's been outlined in detail by the CED policy paper that we had to remove the excess human resource from agriculture. This was the only way that we could solve what he defined as this tendency to produce more than the market could take by way of agricultural production. I guess, uh, Chuck, that we can equate excess human resource in agriculture to individual ownership. Now, you had some questions uh, for the good doctor about that, didn't you, Jack? Yes, I told him I was a little gloomy on this whole program. I didn't quite follow him. And I always thought that in our Constitution, this was right to ownership was the basic of our United States. 
he pointed out, well, this is just doesn't hold true. He said, uh, in, a, in our period, uh, while we're getting the farmers off of the farm, and which will be done in two years, why we'll have them in the factories working and getting a guaranteed wage. At this time, why we'll have great prosperity again. What's going to happen uh, at the end of the two years? We get all the farmers off the farms, get them into the urban areas, uh, contribute to the urban crisis all the more, uh, leave the land. What's the answer? Think? Well, I think utter chaos is the only answer that you can have. Uh, but before I go into that any deeper, I would like to back up on this term that they use of the excess human resources in agriculture. Is this a CED term? Yes, it's a it. CED, and that the doctor also used the term. I see. But the implication is there that those people who cannot make a living in agriculture, that they are excess. Now, there is no such thing as an excess of producers out here. The problem is the low prices. So if you were to classify any other industry or equate any industry with this same term and have them sell at the prices that they received 20 years ago, which is uh, what the farmer, well, the farmer isn't even receiving the prices today that he received 20 years ago, then by on the same definition, you'd have to say that the total economy was in excess or all the people in it well, were in excess. I think this point came up in the conversation. I think I asked the doctor, well, if we have excess in agriculture and this is your solution, what is your solution for the excess in industrial America? We have a million people on relief in New York City alone. Or is this just a, uh, is just is this just a small factor or a dislocation? And I think at that point he said, "No, this is not. This is a little more serious than that." Yes. But nevertheless, he was continuously indicating when we were asking him what was he going to do with another two and a half million people in industry when the rate of employment was already rising and rising at a terrific rate and he always tried to fall back on all this was temporary. Mm -hmm. But the language is in the paper. It says here on page 25 of the CED policy paper on agriculture, the principal one, a program such as we are recommending here to induce excess resources, people primarily to remove or to move rapidly out of agriculture. And then this is the same language you hear from the horse's mouth. So here's what you have, Bill. You have a policy paper that's been printed. It's put on the library shelves. It's in every college. Every economist in the country gets it. And our people out here either uh, question that it's even in existence. Did this man talk about human distress? Yes, that uh, was brought up and brought up very emphatically. I asked him the question, what he was going to do with these people and what it would do to these people. And he was, his statement was that admittedly, this uh, interim or this transfer to a different type of agriculture would be very painful and that he felt indeed sorry for the people been presently involved in agriculture because they were going to have to take this pain. But he said, nevertheless, it's got to be done. So I'd say it's a pretty cold uh, approach to it. And it ended up then finally with, and this was one of the final statements or questions that I asked him, that am I to conclude from the discussion that we have had here today that we are going to make the people of this nation serve the dollar or the people who have the great amount of those dollars rather than have the dollar serve the people? And with some hesitation, he said, well, basically, I would say that you're correct. Can you believe this, Jack, what you're hearing well, and what you heard? I can't say how shocking this was. I have been informed of this, this program, this material has been put in front of us. I read it, I studied it, but it still doesn't have the effect on me as it did when I heard it right straight from the economic advisor. And there's no question about it, it's there and is moving fast. And when he pointed out we, he wanted this done in two years, this is another shocking part of it, too. Two years. we got to move fast. Two years? Well, Chuck, who's going to do the farming? Well, as you know, the average age in agriculture is getting quite old. 59, isn't it? Something, Something like somewhere that. Somewhere in it's being quoted in that area. There'll always be an agriculture. Somebody's got to do the farming. But the program here is to 
convert the ownership of the farmland over to others. And this is why we're liquidating the plant. Now, I don't believe this came up in exactly this form in the interview, but I have had conversations with others, predecessors, including Dr. Schnitker, and I asked him that exact question in Des Moines one time. He said, well, when we get around to it and have to do it, why, we'll bring them out from the cities. <laughs> and I presume he meant uh, your peon labor force or your what we call peasantry. And this is where we will go take agriculture if this program continues is to an agricultural peasantry. Let's uh, leave the uh, theories and the facts and the impressions that you all had of what the man said for just a moment. And uh, let me ask you about your impressions of the man himself, Dr. Hodiker. Jack, what did you think of him? Well, I got the impression from him that he was just straightening me out, that I had, uh, I had a lot to learn. I didn't un understand the problem. What about you, Chuck? How did you react to the man? To the man, I'd say he's a sincere man. He's a scholar, but he's also the prisoner of a theory period, the one he grew up and has spent his life with. I think he's uneasy about this because I think there is in the back of his head some question about whether or not the nostrums that are being propounded are correct. So this is kind of the impression I had, a troubled man. Think? Well, I thought one of the greatest impressions I had of him is that the man was extremely honest in talking to us. I've sparred with other economists, and he mentioned Dr. Snitker before, and they've always, while they were propounding this theory, were always leading me to believe, or trying to lead me to believe that lower prices would be good for me. This man was honest. He made no bones about exactly what the plans were, what had to be, and what, if it's in their power, is going to be done. So I'd say I'd have to admire the man at least from, for giving us to us straight from the shoulder. And I think it had better be a warning to the people involved. To get back to what the man said, the warnings that he issued, and... Uh, the very disheartening uh, realities that uh, you all came away with. Was anything said there by him or by any of you about the pure and simple fact that agriculture, that farming to thousands of people is a satisfactory, rewarding way of life and a way of life that these people would like to retain? Was this factor talked about? Well, I think it came in in that, uh, pretty much in that discussion, that it was a painful process, yes. but that unfortunately it was going to have to be endured by those people, that he felt sorry for the people that were involved in agriculture, but still this is never nevertheless the way it's got to be. So there was a, a very little room there for discussion mm -hmm. for people because there was no interest yes. in the people or the welfare of the people involved. Bill, I got the impression that it was almost a scene out of darkness at noon. <laughs> where the, where the, the multitude was being horsewhipped through the desert for 40 years to their own theoretical future happiness. Well, Chuck, this government policy and stated attitude toward the farmer, stated by Dr. Hodiker, do you feel that this is the result of ignorance or is it a matter of just uh, pure self-interest? Well, I think from an economic point of view, there's really no compelling mandate for the economic policy we've been following, nor uh, is there any real reason why there should be this lack of participation by the farmer in the welfare or the well-being of the society. Most of it is being accomplished to serve certain people. The objectives are very simple, assurance, an abundance of cheap raw materials, cheap food, shoes, clothing, products that people use to relieve the upward pressure among those who have a large number of employees, and this would be your mature fortune corporations, surplus labor force to constantly arrive in the city, and this creates a, a pressure to keep the union or organized labor force a docile mm -hmm. group. 
And, of course, there's the factor of uh, manipulation between keeping farm raw materials at 50% of parity or above slightly, but never at 100% so they can make a profit in buying the raw material and, again, in selling the finished product. So, really, what you have here is a distortion of resource use in agriculture, and it's being called efficiency. And this, from any point of view, is simply conjectural economics. Jack, what, in your opinion, was the highlight of the interview with Dr. Houdeker? I think it was where he uh, said that uh, we're overproducing, you might say producing too much for the market, uh, with the same resources. And at that point, Fink came in with an extraordinary example, I thought. What did you say at that point, Fink? Well, of course, that uh, the uh, we were not produce getting the additional production with the same resources, that all of the increase in production that he had been talking about was being bought by the American farmer and paid for it dearly, and that that additional increase was not even being paid for what it was costing. So, in order to make the point that the corporations, which is a recommended type of agriculture, could not produce for even the same amount that the family farmer is producing now, I ask his uh, indulgence to listen just long enough to actual costs, costs off of my own farm that would illustrate that it cannot be produced for the projected price of 75 cents an acre, or 75 cents a bushel. That's corn we're talking about now. So I ask him, would he concede that I would have to figure 6% in on interest on the land as a cost? He thought that was a very fair figure. I ask him, would he also agree that we had to figure the taxes as a cost for owning the land? He said that was right. So then on the basis of my own farm, now this is not figuring today's inflated land prices that you hear talk about, but the actual price that I paid for my farm after World War II. The interest on the investment and the taxes on the land would be $38 an acre just to own the land. This includes nothing else, just the cost of owning it. Then he had mentioned that single cross hybrid seed corn had definitely increased the yield, and this we were ignoring when we uh, were talking about prices as to the days gone by. And for on account of this increase, we couldn't expect as big a price. So then I pointed out to him that the days that he was talking about, the days of open pollinated, the very best seed that you could buy, seed corn, would cost you a dollar a bushel. And at that time, we were planting 10 acres with a bushel of seed corn. So our cost would have been 10 cents an acre. But today, in single cross hybrid seed, that comes packed in packages not bushels, but packages, 80,000 seeds per package. And 80,000 seeds will exactly plant five acres for me. So at that rate, my cost for seed today is $5 an acre, 50 times higher mm -hmm. than it was at that time. So I add that $5. Now, you mentioned fertilizer, herbicides, and insecticides, that all of these had increased their yield, which is true, but which, again, we are buying. So my cost on my farm per acre of corn for the last two years of, of just these chemicals has been $34 an acre. So if you will add these costs, the $38 an acre for owning the land, you cost uh, the $5 for seed per acre and the fertilizer, we have a total cost of $77 an acre. Now we haven't plowed a furrow yet. We haven't done any cultivating. We haven't dropped a kernel of seed. We haven't applied any herbicides, insecticides, or fertilizer. We haven't done any harvesting. We haven't figured any cost for this high-priced machinery that we have today. We haven't dried any grain. We haven't stored any. We haven't paid any cost for transportation to market. And already, without doing anything, we've got $77 cost. Now, in the state of Iowa, the nation's leading corn-producing state at least most years, the highest average yield that we have ever had was 94 bushel per acre, according to USDA. So 94 bushel an acre multiplied by the 75 cents a bushel projected price would give us $70 gross income on that acre. So right there alone, we have a loss of $6.50 an acre before we've started doing any producing whatsoever. 
So how can the corporations produce any cheaper than that? What was his answer to all this? At this point, the meeting was ended. Well, think, in view of the facts that you and Chuck and Jack learned in your visit with uh, Dr. Haddocker, and in view of the facts that have been presented here on this program today, will you tell our viewers what you think is going to happen to American agriculture? Well, Bill, what's going to happen is going to depend solely and completely on those people out there and what they do. There's only one way they can eliminate the family farm and destroy rural America, and that is by bringing prices down. So if the farmers out there are going to depend on the people who are manipulating them out of business, depend on them to set the price, you can just bet that the whole rural community is going to be destroyed. The only way it can be done is if the people out there sit by in complacency and watch it happen. There's only one thing that can prevent it, as I see it now, and that is full fair prices for the American farmer that lets him stay in business. The whole rural community is involved in this. It is their destruction. So first of all, I think we need to get the support from the businessmen to encourage the farmers to do something for their problem, and then a realization of the farmers what must be done. Once the farmers get together and say, this is the price you're going to pay me, what is anybody going to do it but pay that price? Exactly as prices are in administered in all other businesses and industries today. The NFO has given the American farmer the opportunity to solve his price problem by blocking his production together and selling it through collective bargaining. With all of us working together and selling together as one man so that our prices cannot be manipulated against us. The NFO has built the structure, organized now in 48 continental United States. We have the marketing area set up in every producing area in the United States. We have already, to a great extent, affected the prices. And all we need now is an additional production blocked together to give us the additional weight to tip the scales all the way the other way. The American farmer can have a price just as soon as he is ready to do his part. So I urge all of you, forget your petty differences, your little beefs, and let's get together to save our hides, to save our very way of life. This is your last chance. The power of the production will finally decide it once you decide to block it together. And it has to be done through the NFO. Thank you very much, Fink. And thanks to you, Chuck and Jack. You. My special guests on this week's show have been the national vice president of the National Farmers Organization, Mr. Earhart Finkston. Also, we have had as a guest Mr. Charles Walters, economist, and Mr. Jack Grimmer, NFO leader from the state of California. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week at this same time on this station. Until we meet again. So long, everybody. Mm -hmm.